Welcome. We are so happy that there are so many faces here today. Uh, I'm Linda and I will be moderating the evening. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of uh, 24, and 24 is a creative agency who helps do good companies to improve their impact and to help them grow bigger. Uh, together with my partner, Eric, who's sitting over there, uh, and together with Dimfi, event organizer of Pakhuis de Zwijger, who is sitting over there, we organized this evening, and we're so joyful that there are so many faces, because you never know when you wanted to organize something. So a big applause already for you coming here and to spreading the social enterprise vibe. <laughs> who went to the bathroom already? The guys and the people who didn't go, please go uh, after our show because you'll see these beautiful products because these are the brands who will be here on stage tonight. So this is uh, Yoni, the founder is here, Mariah, but also Melle van de Goetrol and of course the managing director of Dr. Bronner, Axel. Uh, the cool thing is that we of course will show uh, these three products because they, uh, all three, uh, are really good in telling stories. And afterwards, we actually found out that there are all hygienic products. This is actually really stupid because we didn't think about it. The thing why we invited them is because they have really particularly a really bold brands, but they use techniques who are really, really different. After the panel about storytelling and how you can improve your impact, we will ask uh, Alex, the co-founder, of oh, sorry, the CEO and captain of the Sea Shepherd, and he will tell you how they changed actually the story of their company because they were first seen as eco-terrorists, but now they actually work together with local governments. So this is quite a big change. How did he manage that? He will tell you. But let's first kick off the evening with our documentary. Uh, this is called Soap for World Peace. This is a part, a 25-minute documentary, and it's part of a, six, uh, of a series of six shows. Uh, we followed six entrepreneurs from everywhere in the world. Uh, think about India, think about Barcelona, think about the United States. And there we followed for 24 hours people who said, okay, I see something's going wrong in the world, and I just, I just don't want to sit around, but I actually want to make a difference, and I want to make money with it. Making, fixing the world and making money, this maybe seems like things you don't can uh, compare or you don't can collide, but we believe this is actually true. And therefore we started this uh, company, of this uh, company and therefore also this documentary series. And um, before we start the series and we show you the episode, I want to know who already knows the brand? Who already knows Dr. Bronner? Okay, who has ever tried it? And did you like it? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I hear a small yes. Do you like it? Yeah. Okay, good. The good thing is that for the ones who don't know the brand, besides us showing the movie, there are also some goodie bags. So afterwards, you can all try the brand and hopefully you will all like it. So please stay after the whole event. Um, I know the brand around five years because I was moderating an event where Dr. Bronners was actually introduced to the Netherlands, and this was around five years ago. I immediately fell in love with the story of Dr. Bronner and their product. So when together with Eric three years ago, I wanted to start and making a documentary, I said to myself, I want to follow these two men. Luckily for me, it worked out, and therefore I would love to show you now the documentary. Thank you. The median wage in America has stagnated and the minimum wage has declined by 30%. You know, this is ridiculous. Everybody who works a regular 40 hour a week job should be able to afford to feed their families. Everything we purchase has some human dimension. Was that labor respected or was it exploited? At the end of the day, this company is all about like, celebrating humanity. It was a $4 million company, now it's a $100 million company, and David and Mike have done that together as brothers, and it's remarkable.
Dr. Bronner's started as a family soap making tradition and grew into a multi-million dollar business. It was founded by the German Jewish soap maker Emanuel Bronner, who immigrated to the United States just before the outbreak of the Second World War. He followed the events from a distance and was deeply moved by the horrors. But the war didn't turn him into a bitter man. He continued to believe that people were fundamentally the same, a vision that would form the basis of Dr. Bronner's, a soap business that's still more focused on doing good than raking in big profits. And ironically, that very philosophy has contributed tremendously to Dr. Bronner's financial success. Today, the company is run by two of Emmanuel's grandsons, David and Mike Bronner. Welcome to San Diego, California. Okay, that's not... Eat him. Eat that, but what is it? It's ready, we can eat him. We can eat it, but you know what it is, what's it called? I know it looks kind of weird, this one looks weird, but it is a... Straw. Straw. Raspberry. <laughs> straw raspberry. That's a strawberry. <laughs> You look at how our soap even started. It was my grandfather talking in auditoriums about his philosophy and people coming to get the freebie soap he was selling or handing out on the side. My granddad was having these incredible experiences of, of love and oneness and people were gathering to buy the soap and weren't really sticking around to hear what he had to say or, or really paying any attention, which for him was number one. I mean, the soap was kind of secondary. So he started putting what he had to say on the labels of our soap. 3,000 years ago, Moses said, every human being is responsible for his action, or that being is still a beast, not yet human. He developed quite a following. Even a guy was crucified in Chicago in like 46 or something, which really got him on the authority screen and he was arrested and thrown in an insane asylum. Then subjected to electroshock, which he um, blamed for his blindness, which his eyesight deteriorated by the late 60s. He was totally blind. Through no fault of his own, he was persecuted and taunted. Luckily, after several attempts, he finally escaped the institution in Illinois and fled to sunny California. Here, he restarted his soap brand, which was temporarily put on hold. He didn't understand just how busy the, the labels were getting and just how small the, the text was getting. You know, it's like our labels were designed by a blind man, you know, it's pretty, pretty amazing. He actually made soap to sell the label, not a label to sell the soap. Usually you make a label to sell the product, and so his was very much the opposite. So now you ask, like, is it the are people coming for the product or the message? Okay. So me and Chris are there, and mine is here. Nah, it's Carly. A pure love puppy. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Puppy's a little scared of cameras. I know. I had somewhat limited contact with my granddad. My dad and my granddad didn't have the best relationship growing up. My husband and I were, were not necessarily raised in ideal families, at least not the ones you see on television in the 1960s. We had to get it. We had to understand that this you know, most important thing was uniting the spaceship Earth, you know? And as a kid, you're just like, you know, what? My grandfather you know, had this vision, much of it born out of the Holocaust. He came from a German Jewish soap making family. Like many bourgeois Jews, it was like, the madness is gonna blow over, we'll, we'll ride this out. And then the Nazis nationalized the factory in like 41. They were deported in 42. The last letter he had ever gotten from his dad said, you know, you were right, and uh, never heard from them again. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be a little conservative. Welcome to my house. It's uh, pretty normal. <laughs> um, obviously taken over much more by, by kid stuff these days. The one thing I knew was I did not want to work for my dad or you know work for the family company. Not that my, you know, my dad's great, it was just like this, no, you know, no, I'm gonna go do my own thing. And after college, uh, went to Amsterdam, had a Euro pass meeting amazing people and just really being exposed to all kinds of different ways of thinking and looking at the world and having some really big psychedelic episodes that, you know, really turned me inside out and, you know, made me realize we are, we live in this spiritual mystery and that my granddad actually was really on it. David has always been very compassionate. I think he was maybe 
three years old, I had a jacket that had a rabbit fur collar. His comment was, oh, mom, I hope they waited until the rabbit died before they took his fur. Bam. David's compassion for all living creatures made him switch to a vegan diet. Plus, his company became a voice for animal welfare by donating money to charitable causes and awareness films, such as Cowspiracy, a reinterpretation of the All One vision. Um, you know, Cowspiracy really went big with the, its Netflix launch. You know, like the theatrical release, of course, hopefully is going to be really impactful, but that, uh, you know, like the Netflix and when, you, when it starts streaming, like that's when it can really, you know, do damage and get viral and all that. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's been a big part of the discussion. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good one. I will. So, you know, my brother is so passionate, and I know in order to argue with him, you have to go to a place where it gets pretty ugly. Um, but the good thing about that is that it always ends up. Um, we always, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, is we have big blowouts, but you know we are even closer afterwards. You know whatever we were fighting about, you know we're very invested in our company and our different projects and ideas. And once in a while, uh, well maybe more pretty frequently, we would just go at it. He'd be like, "Oh, dude, you're a motherfucking activist with your head in the clouds. You're gonna run a motherfucking company in the ground." And on my side, I'd be like, dude, you're like a fucking soulless businessman. You don't give a fuck about our mission. Like, you know what I mean? So it was just like a ridiculous kind of stereotyping of each other. I don't think I can count on more than two fingers the times I've left work angry at my brother. Everything is all the way, right? Either activist to the max or um, Buddha to the max. And uh, sometimes you have to, you have to you have to what it, poke the bear to get to the Buddha. <laughs> uh, you know, I, forgot, I forgot a towel. It was never the intent for both brothers to work together. Mike first had his own urge to see the far corners of the world, which came as quite a surprise, not least to himself. You know, I was always the one who would get just a little bit homesick at summer camp, but I'd never really kind of gotten off and just tried to make a life on my own terms. And so I decided to go to Asia and teach English for three years. I kind of felt like I broke away. So my dad was basically running Dr. Bronner's because my granddad's failing health. And then a month later, he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I decided to, to stay in Japan because I wasn't ready to come and, and be part of the whole family dynamic. I mean, it was a really traumatic time. So I let my dad know, hey, I'm ready to come in and help. And I guess first, like how to just do basic operations, basic inventory control, make sure you got the right materials, right quality and right price, and you're making the right soap all the time, every time. And my grandfather passed away in 1997, um, my father in 1998. It wasn't until talking to my brother and I realized that I wanted to pursue something more. And so I came back living with my mom in her house, working out of an office in her house with my brother, sharing the same computer. So it was quite a change. To make hemp oil out of the seeds. When I go on business trips, I go to different countries and I usually stay, you know, at reasonably nice hotels. Sometimes when my brother goes on business trips, uh, he stays in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's connection to Asia, however, never vanished. And today he's showing a Japanese delegation around the factory. His comment about his brother's jail time was not some practical joke. So hemp was coming off globally, and we had you know, started using hemp seed oil in the soap, and then Bush started making moves to ban hemp, and we're gearing up for a fight, and then 9-11 happened. So they went after industrial hemp, they went after all the medical marijuana dispensaries. They were just, you know, felt like they'd been given a blank check and just accomplished their agenda. It's like the most absurd example of an out-of-control drug war that is placing a non-drug industrial agricultural crop in the same schedule as you know, heroin and LSD. It was just ridiculous. Okay, and we're gonna cut this way. And then that's our cannabis wall. I guess, look at that, it's all organized. 
So this is me planting hemp seeds on DEA's lawn and getting arrested in front of the White House, harvesting hemp. So technically, I got, I don't know, 10 pounds of marijuana here, according to the you know, ridiculous policy in this country. Um, but, you know, there's no drug value whatsoever in these plants. You know, it's amazing. The U.S. market for hemp seed food and hemp seed products is the largest in the world. And American farmers are systematically cut out of this global booming industry. Take a look at David Bronner as firefighters cut him out of his cage, ending his protest. Like the first big victory was February 6th. We got the Ninth Circuit to back DEA down and it was like the first time DEA had ever gotten back down. Um, this was the shovel that I dug up the DEA's lawn with and planted hemp seeds. Actually it wasn't, it was a replica of the shovel. DEA actually confiscated our shovels, but there was a message because I knew the DEA was gonna do that. So here's a message to the DEA. American farmers shall grow hemp again. Reefer madness will be buried. Kabam! Marketing was always a dirty word. You know, marketing insinuated that you were selling somebody an illusion and kind of tricking them into buying something. We do a lot of earned media work, which is getting the media to cover our brand and talk about it. We have a lot of stories to tell as a brand, and so we feel like that's a little more authentic than advertising because you're not paying for the coverage, you're earning it. Does it build the brand and reputation? It does, because it, it, it um, resonates with people. Yeah, so I'm gonna be... Yeah, yeah. Wow, you got something else? Shit. So, my, this is in honor of my dad. So my dad developed firefighting foam for, um, actually, Monsanto's firefighting division back in the day. It came from the place of taking my grandfather's soap, my dad's technology, and making that a vehicle for showering, for enjoyment, for, celebra for celebration, and just kind of bringing that vibe to the people. This is not about selling soap. This is about changing the world. This is this engine to promote the all one vision and to do good shit in the world. Okay, so here's where the weirdos live. Yeah. <laughs> you mean those weirdos? <laughs> My mom was, was like, put on some clothes. And I'm like, mom, stop antagonizing me. More can come off. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, currently the only in-house graphic designer. We're making a special version for our Fair, Fair Pay Today campaign. You know, a lot of people who are living on minimum wage, which, which is currently $7, can't make ends, ends meet. They can't um, afford the rent, they can't afford food. And we're just trying to do our, our part to uh, raise awareness about the whole thing. Right now we're fighting for the fair minimum wage. We've had 50 years of massive economic growth and shareholder profits and executive pay have exploded, but the median wage in America has stagnated and the minimum wage has declined by 30% from its high point in the late 60s, and this is ridiculous. Everybody who works a regular 40 hour a week job should be able to afford to feed their families. 
Every time we sell a bottle, a percentage of that goes towards making that a reality all over the country. We're all about really investing in the number one thing that makes Dr. Bronner's what it is, and that's our people. We cap our salaries at five to one of the lowest paid full-time worker. All of the benefits that the employees have did come from my husband. He also started with uh, the health insurance and dental insurance. And this is not only for the employees, but it is for their entire family. We provide uh, child care. Every year when we go to renew our benefits, our insurance benefits, they usually tell us, hey, nobody else does what you guys are proposing to do. Are you sure you want to do this? In return, you know, the morale is super high. Turnover is super low and they give 110 percent. It's not so much the benefits but knowing that they really care about you and support you. We have people here who have worked here 30 plus years and their children, their mothers, uncles, aunts work here. Let us be generous, fair, and loving to Spaceship Earth and all its inhabitants, for we're all one or none. All one. We can't get together anymore. Everybody's so darn busy. We used to get together every Sunday, but now it's, you know, we're, we're lucky if it's twice a month. So why don't I talk to mom one more time? Here, Mike. No, we're not. We're not. We're calling off the presents. Well, I think that you'll find that there's more business decisions that are easier to make than what they were going to celebrate birthdays on. We gave a million dollars to labeling GMOs easier than we did celebrating birthdays. So, um, you know, the family business, it's it's great. You know, obviously, I have my brother's back. He has my back. My mom. There's a bond there that goes beyond dollars and cents and soap and raw materials. <laughs> Any disagreement we may have at work tends to come out after you've had a couple of drinks and your tongue is loose, you know. <laughs> Next thing you know, your voices are raised and can be quite colorful. Michael, what's up? Okay. This is my brother-in-law, Michael. He's our chief of operations. Yeah. yeah, real quick, I want to tell you did, you, did you hear like what Target ordered for lotion? No. For next week, they ordered 2,074 cases. Oh my gosh. I don't know if that's realistic. So we sold the Target uh, seven and a half months of lotion in five weeks. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Hi, Mike. I'm just with Darcy. Hey, um, I'm, I'm on my way up to Kiyomi's house. Oh, yeah. Well, Ryan was going to drive me anyway home. Oh. So one way or the other, I'm drinking. Actually, I, should, I think I should drive. Where did they bring it up? What would you suggest? Bam! So you off school? Yep. Good. How's your day going? Good, good. I, uh, I'm on video. Part of the reason why Dr. Bronner's has been so successful in growing internationally in such a short period of time is because Mike is the primary driver in the company for the international sales. So in a way, he's kind of the brand's international ambassador. If we see a business partner that we haven't seen in a year or something, you know, he'll remember something about the fact that they did this, you know, local charity campaign two years ago, and he'll ask them about it. He genuinely loves people, and that comes out. Since I do not like being out in the forefront, what David does is scary to me because he speaks on panels, he's gone to Washington, D.C., and he fights for what he believes in. It wasn't until like in the last 10 years where I realized just how shy he is and that despite this shyness, he gets out of this comfort zone and he fights for what is right. I'm a very non-confrontational person. When he does all of this, I just really uh, marvel and remember, I'm still his mother. You're genitarian about it.
the E less, me, and B, make sure it's correct. You know, and we support everybody. So. Yeah. He can educate himself with like these chemical dictionaries and encyclopedias, and then argue with top chemists about organic integrity and win. There's an old saying that more companies get into trouble because of tremendous growth than any other way. The first time it grew 20%, we had a tiger by the tail, and when a company grows, it needs a lot of finances. And so we had to do a lot of scrambling to get money into the company to sustain the growth. Being independent, being family owned, means they're not beholden to this emphasis or priority to make profit. Your primary point of uh, operation is to maximize shareholder return. That's your number one responsibility. And if you're not doing that, shareholders can sue you and say like, stop giving my profits away. You're not maximizing my return. A benefit corp is a new corporate form. It's for profit, but it's kind of a hybrid of a for nonprofit and enables you to give away your profits. There's so much connection we have with so much of what's gone before, what's happening now, and you know where we want to go. And so that's why sometimes yeah. I spend a lot of time talking yeah. about this one picture of my brother or yeah. one picture from Heilbrunn. It's just, it just, there's really so much connection yeah. here. Yeah. No, I, it, I don't have a line. Maybe we got lamps. We need lamps. Who's got lamps? To sell shares would, would really cripple the uh, ability of the, the family and the company to do what it does. Outside money comes with strings. So we are able to do what we want, when we want, but we do, of course, listen to our advisors. You can frame any company as a family business or an independent business, um, but that, that on its own doesn't make it inherently good or inherently progressive. If you're not careful to define something with actual substance, family business is just going to be another, another buzzword. Old-fashioned business beliefs dictate that in order to gain wealth, someone else should pay the price. Dr. Bronner's demonstrates that we can do things differently and that we can all benefit if we treat one another with dignity and respect. All one does not mean that there is no difference in this world. It just means that underneath it, there's something that brings us all together. If we can expand our concept of family in the world, there is more joy to be had, you know? What we do in our everyday lives, you know, reflects and honors this deeper connection. I mean, we all got to do business, but, you know, life is about a lot more. And we're part integrated of a, you know, a much larger society and environment. Uniting the spaceship Earth seems like an end goal of epic proportions. If we bring the story closer to home, it seems as if the Dr. Bronner family finally themselves have learned what it means to be one. I realize that my, my kids, of course, are all mature, they're all old, and now they know my faults and love me anyway. It's amazing to see the documentary on such a big screen. So thank you, Davey, uh, Dimfi, for uh, letting us present your documentary. And now let's get the maker of the documentary on stage, Erik. Uh, and I want to say a quick hi to Eva, because Eva, she's here tonight, and she helped us with feedback to make the movie much better, and Florian, who was the sound editor and sound mixer, so uh, sound designer as well. So thank you so much for also being here. Erik, uh, why do you think these stories are important to tell? For example, the one about Dr. Bronner. Um, I think, well, I think all stories have a purpose, uh, whether it's selling a product or you know, uh, getting people motivated or um, trying to uh, um, make an awareness. 
And, um, and I think there have been a lot of films such as uh, An Unconvenient Truth, um, Before the Flood, who have shown a message which I agree with. I just, just not the way that I would present it because, I mean, it's already kind of in the title, uh, Before the Flood or An Unconvenient Truth. About 95% of their um, message is about this threat. And then 5% on the end is kind of like, well, change your light bulbs or do this and that and uh, you know, we'll all be saved. Um, and for me, that wasn't really inspiring in the sense, you know, but on the other hand, peers around me were, were because they were doing this kind of stuff, but they weren't getting the same podium as all these, this negativity. So we, we actually flipped it around and said, you know, 5% is about the, the problem. And then, because we know about climate change, we know about poverty, we know about all these issues, and then the other 95%, we're gonna show somebody who does something about it. So that's, that's I think that it, I, it has mo mostly to do with our, our news cycle and how it, how it works. And I think we can change that by you know, showing examples. Do you recognize yourself in any of the founders, in Mike or in David? Because there are two really different characters. Um, yeah, I think for, I, I recognize myself in David, you know, sometimes it comes off a bit quirky and a bit strange and, you know, he, uh, what he's, I mean, he's a very clever man in the sense, but it just, sometimes it's, it just comes, comes out wrong and I also have that a lot. Um, Here you see them uh, standing next to one another. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just. He's, he is this really loving person who, yeah, it just tries to do all he can um, with, yeah, with, when I look back, I have a child now of my own with, um, <laughs> with you. Uh, <laughs> I carried it for nine months, but okay. No, I, I, I mean, when we filmed him, I didn't really understand, but like I do understand, I do, I, you can see just how uh, Mike is with his child and you can see the dynamic and you can see his, you know, and I, I really hope I, yeah, I, I've, I thought about it uh, over the last months a lot, you know, I, I really hope that I can, I'll be a, become a father just, like, a, a, just as Mike is so loving for his child, yeah. So I think more people maybe want to start a business or want to start a project. How do you start a project? So we started the documentary. How do you start? And what do you need to start? Yeah, I think the first, I think guts is the, is the main one. Um, we didn't know a lot about long stories. I only did things that were three minutes long or five minutes long, something with a bigger arc was more difficult, definitely, to, to do something that was a bit longer. Um, but it's, you just have to dive in the deep and then just, yeah, sometimes you hit rock bottom and sometimes it's sweet sailing, but it's, um, you're gonna fail, you're gonna win, it's, yeah. I don't, yeah, that's, I think that's it, mostly. And how is it to work with your partner on such a big project? <laughs> um, smooth, uh, next question. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, we're two people, we're two people who are not. Now he looks at me, eh? yeah, yeah. It's because, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, difficult. I mean, it's two people, we, we are never, never indifferent about anything, you know? So it's not, it, it, we don't let go of something very quickly. And so if I have my way of thinking and you have your way, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's like Tom and Jerry, you know? <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah. But it's, you know, it, I think I, I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, I really don't, I wouldn't want it to be any different. Um, I hope that maybe uh, I'll, I'll, I'll become milder. I'll, I, I, think, I think I'm the one that says sorry the most, no? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> well, you've seen the movie, of course, a number of times. Are there things you want to change? Uh, I think that's uh, a kind of a difficult question. Uh, it's a good question, but it's... Uh, of course, there are a lot of things I would change. I think the most beautiful thing about it is... Uh, those little moments in between when you see the character and I think that maybe if we use more of that instead of the talking heads We would get a different kind of movie um, 
It was very difficult for us to, to make this one because we wanted to make something of 25 minutes. And uh, Dr. Bronner has a lot of stories. I mean, they also do fair, cha fair, uh, fair trade products. They have so many. And to have your focus was, was really difficult. And um, kind of as a filmmaker, you collect all the material, and then you come home, and then you're like, I, I actually called one of my friends. I said, well, I come home, and then, and then I have all the images. And then I was like, shit, you know, I don't have the thing that I really need do you recognize yourself in that? And he was like, you know, that's the job description of a maker, you know, you just work with what you've got. And so, yeah, there are many things that I would change, uh, but I think uh, what I think worked really well is to, that you see the character and personalities of these two men who, um, you know, maybe didn't have the same, it's kind of like the king, you know, it's like you, they, they inherited the throne uh, and they became that, and they didn't. They might not have had the same business experience or the same kind of education to to get where they needed to go, or at that moment. But they just they, they've worn that role over time, and they've really gotten comfortable at it, and they rule it with compassion and love, unlike any other company I've ever seen. You know, in, instead of having highly educated university graduates from A-list universities, for example. Okay, uh, to wrap off this talk, what's your most of the best uh, moment actually in the movie? Um, for me personally, I think the, the scene that we had um, when we recorded the, the uh, LA Pride, which is a big pride f uh, from in LA, I think this is a picture. I mean, I, I, we were, it was, I think it was probably one of the most joyous days I've ever had. Um, it's, it's really festive, but then along the way we got to a point in the, in the road where a group of protesters was there and I got really infuriated and angry and I looked at them and I, I saw that and I, I don't know. And for example, I thought to myself, you know, I'm from the Netherlands, we, uh, you know, gay marriage is something very progressive. Um, why are they doing this? Why are these people protesting? And there was a young man in a tutu waving a wand and blowing kisses to this group of protesters. And I just walked up to him and I said, you know, aren't you seething with anger when you're seeing this? And he just looked at me and he said, no, you have to understand, uh, you know, every year this group is getting smaller and smaller. And for me, that was a sign of, you know, disrespect and kind of, and for him, it was a sign of progress. And, and I started crying. Uh, out of joy, you know, just because of his answer. And he just like, did my want just do that, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so it really changed my, for, for me that was, because we made this series actually out of this hope that things are going better and that progress is coming, but you, you really have to kind of experience it. And, and this man was experiencing it. And, and my view about that particular moment was changed. Like what this man is going through right now in this anger, that's really sad. That's really sad. But you have to, you have to be able to switch, switch that around and you can't beat that with other, more anger. Okay, thank you so much. Now I would love to ask Axel on stage. Axel, Managing Director of Dr. Brunnish Europe. Please sit uh, next to Eric. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Hi, everybody. What do you think of the movie, and do you recognize Mike and David in it? Way too much, actually. It's uh, <laughs> scary. No, seriously. I mean, you you have a perfect. You've you've done a perfect job in in catching and and putting their personalities on display. This is truly who they are, and and how they get along with each other, and how they do their daily routine and stuff. Frightening. And which part of the movie did you like the best? There were actually two parts. Um, one is, takes, takes a tiny bit of an explanation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the background story of Dr. Bronner's, but it's been a German company. I mean, they were the inventors of uh, liquid soap some 160 years ago in the southern parts of Germany. 
And uh, to make this kind of a short story, um, the entire family was killed in the concentration camps because it's been a, a Jewish family. And Emmanuel Bronner has seen this coming, so he was the only one who, who has escaped. Um, so those are the, the German parts, and uh, this is obviously the US American side. And now just to poke some fun into this, uh, this is my favorite part of, one of the favorite parts of this story. You guys could see Mike Bronner uh, heading towards the office. Did you see what kind of socks he was wearing? He was wearing white socks. So this is like a typical German situation. They're wearing white <laughs> socks with sandals and he's always doing this. Um, and then uh, the second part is definitely how Oh, it's Mike. really in the details. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And second part is definitely about um, Mike and David, um, how they describe the way they get along with each other and how they truly fight with each other. I mean, sometimes in the executive meetings that we have, um, that it's, it's truly about fighting. I mean, the next thing would be hitting each other. They never do this, but uh, um, it's kind of... It's kind of this, this crazy, almost mystical real relationship that the yeah. two have. Uh, I think, I think that for example, like when I go to Linda's parents' house and I see the dynamic and something goes wrong, like from a bird's eye view, so I can really say, any, like, Linda, maybe you shouldn't do this and this. But when it comes to my family, you know, all rationale is out of the door. You know, it's like even, even if you want to be, you know, compassionate, loving, I mean, because the, the, the bond is so close, so you can't hide that. Yeah, but, but again, I mean, this is full circle, right? So they, they fight each other, and then they love each other in the very next moment. Um, I don't know. This is, this is very special. I couldn't do this with my own brother. <laughs> Never, ever. We would continue fighting, that's yeah. for sure. I'll try working with your partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how did you end up uh, working at Dr. Bronner's? Um, basically, when, when I grew up, I always had this naive childhood dream um, of bringing some change to the world because I had a hard time understanding why people were actually fighting uh, each other over nothing pretty much um, so then I went on to uh, study law because I was super naive and thought that law you can make a change yeah. would bring any change uh, finished my studies though because I, I found and still find law a very interesting interesting subject from a pure academic perspective And then I went on to study business in the States, um, went to a special school that I was always dreaming of, and uh, because I thought, well, it, it's always coming down to money. With money, you can change pretty much everything on this planet. Um, and then I got into CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, so we did some research. And that was some 12 years ago, and Bronner's was always considered to be the benchmark. Uh, where nobody could explain why they were as social uh, responsible as they were. Patagonia was also one player, um, but mainly Bronner's beyond any belief, uh, along with Patagonia. Um, and then I went back to Germany, started my own consulting business on CSR. And after three, four years, um, Circle closed somehow uh, through a mutual friend um, who knew Bronner's in the States and then kind of asked me if I could picture myself uh, becoming their representative and until this day, and, and it's not all glory and shiny, but uh, till this day, this is pretty much the only company I can see myself working at. Have they found, have they found the formula now? What is their trick? What trick you mean? You mean I mean you say this is they're they're beating all odds. They have no marketing. They have no shareholders. They pay their fair, these these are almost like three elements that any good capitalist company have you know to pr uh, prosper and to grow. Yeah. They don't do it. Has anybody found why why it's so successful? Has some economic student uh, <laughs> figured it out yet? Um, I mean, they've definitely tried their best to really nail this down in order to duplicate things. Um, if you ask me, what it comes down to is this highest level of authenticity. So nothing is really planned. And uh, a few minutes ago, you pointed out a very interesting aspect. Um, it's a pure family business. So Mike and David have inherited their position from their from their fathers and their ancestors. Yeah. In any other case, they wouldn't have become CEOs and presidents at all. Mm -hmm. Mike is a teacher, uh, David is an activist and a biologist. Um, so they have really taken over their positions 
by heart, not with their heads. If you so you're saying we should get more teachers to run big companies? <laughs> not necessarily, but but it's definitely it's definitely about thinking out of the box and letting go about like structures that are outdated completely. And sometimes business school doesn't really teach you what to do right in life at all. Yeah. Uh, before we ask the founders of Yoni and the Gutra on stage, is there anyone who has a question already now about the documentary for Eric or maybe for Axel? <coughs> yeah. Did I see? Oh, sorry, I thought I saw somebody. What was the photographer? <laughs> no questions yet? Yeah, one question. I'll come here with a mic. Can you please stand up? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, now, my question is, uh, you write a lot on your uh, labels, but what is it exactly that you write? Is it the history of the company? or? No, actually, when, when, um, when uh, Emmanuel Bronner lost his family to the Holocaust, he was, he was dramatically motivated to change the world to the better. And he came up with a very simple statement we are all one or none, meaning that there is no difference in between human beings, um, no matter where you come from, what, what sex you are, what religious, political background, everybody is equal and we would need to take care of mother nature in this equation. Um, and in order to prove his statement, his, his point, he was researching all philosophies, religions, everything he could find in order to show to the people that even all religions mean the same. We are all one or none. And basically he printed all the statements on his label because this is the very origin of the company. He wasn't into, into founding a company and, and doing business. He went on a mission to reunite a uh, human spaceship, human mankind. And he was giving speeches to pretty much everybody that wasn't fast enough to run away, um, <laughs> literally. And uh, when, he, when he came to realize that people were, were very much into his soap that he's produced based on the formulations of his ancestors in his garage, that he was giving away as a present after his speeches, he kind of merged his mission with the soap. So the soap became the symbol for his quest and for his mission to reunite human mankind. The, this is what you find. The text is really out there. I mean, it's really, it's a, start reading, it's real fun. Yeah, <laughs> more, more or less, it takes time. <laughs> because that's actually a question I have. It takes time, because what were you thinking the first time when you were seeing the bottle or when you were maybe reading the text? How did it grow on you? It gives me a hard time to remember because I saw this in the States some 10 years ago. I think I, think I, I was associating this with like warning signs and I was considering this to be like a poisonous product. Uh, and we are running into situations like this even nowadays still. Um, and then the very next moment I kind of started reading it and it's not meant to be taken literally. I mean, he was quoting people that I wouldn't quote nowadays at all. Um, but he was very thorough in his analysis. So he was uniting everything. Thank you so much. And now I would like to ask on stage Melle, founder of The Good Roll, and Yoni, uh, Mariah, founder of Yoni. Please come on stage. Uh, Mariah, let's start with you. Can you please explain what Yoni is? Yeah, so uh, Yoni, we make organic cotton tampons, pads, and panty liners, and I never thought I would found a company, let alone a company in uh, tampons. It's not a childhood dream, um, <laughs> funnily <Why not>? enough. <laughs> but it turns out to be actually a lot of fun, and I uh, founded the company basically based on a very personal experience. I turned 30 in the Netherlands. You have to go... Uh, and have a checkup, and I found out that I was in developmental stages of cervical cancer. And I took the next six months going in and out of hospitals, but also trying to figure out what I could do to further support my health. And one of my specialists uh, advised me to start using organic cotton products instead of products with plastics, synthetics, perfumes uh, that are not transparent. And so I was totally, I mean, it was a personal thing, and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Um, 
then two years later, uh, after biking through the rain uh, and in the past two years, often being in the situation where I was like at Schiphol and was confronted with, there's not that special organic store to buy my special tampons at. Um, I ended up at one of my best friend's houses and she's like, why are you so wet? And I'm like, well, I had to bike around to get my special tampons. And we started talking about uh, the subject and she's like, well, what are tampons made of? Aren't they all just made out of cotton? And we took their boxes of products and we took a look at them and they actually don't list any of the ingredients generally on the packaging of these very intimate products, which is, till this day, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Um, and this is when we're like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to not only tell the story, but we're going to make sure that there's an organic cotton choice on every shelf. And this is actually working, right? Yeah. Because it's not only sold in like the more organic shops, but you're also selling in the more regular stores. Yeah, no. So uh, even I think it was during our crowdfunding, uh, we were already approached by Atols, and they gave us the fantastic chance to go on shelves. And it was really the first time, I think, in in the Netherlands for sure, in Europe, most kind of, I like to say, the world, <laughs> that sounds so great, um, that an organic cotton option was on a mainstream shelf next to the synthetic options with the ingredients listed on the box. Um, fantastic moment. Uh, Melle, you're actually one of the founders of The Good Roll. Uh, this evening is about storytelling, so can you maybe pitch your story um. in 30 seconds? <laughs> Um, yeah, um, the good roll, it's uh, toilet paper that builds toilets. Uh, we're the only 100% eco-friendly toilet paper in the world and we don't need 50% uh, of our proceeds to build toilets in third world countries. Okay, I see a few people. But toilet paper, it seems like kind of boring. If you look at the shelves of products, it's so super boring. And I know you a bit, you're not boring at all. And you also have several uh, other companies, uh, Horeca places. How did a guy who has several Horeca places, bars, how did you end up with such a boring product? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, actually, we are a company uh, in the restaurants. We build concepts for uh, restaurants and hospitality. Um, and it actually started with my mother because uh, I knew the question was coming. Uh, so yesterday I was talking about this question at home and actually my mother, um, when I was really, really young, I came home one time at Christmas and she invited, uh, I think about 20 homeless guys uh, for the people that are from Amsterdam in the Vondel Park, you had a really big bridge and under that bridge were always a lot of homeless people sleeping. Um, and I came home for Christmas and my mother invited almost over 20 uh, homeless people for Christmas wow. dinner. Yeah, that was really crazy. They all stole gifts from me, so that was really nice. Um, <laughs> and actually, I thought that's where it started because um, we come from a really commercial background uh, in hospitality, and for us, it was all about making money. Uh, and this sounds really cliche, but uh, when my first child was born, um, I was also not only thinking about making money, but also about making uh, impact and creating a better world that we're all part of. Uh, that's what I really loved about uh, the Browner brand. Um, and that's actually for us what it's all about. We are named the good role, uh, but we want to roll out goodness. Uh, and we want to create a better world. And we do this by creating uh, toilets. Uh, we're now busy for a year, and we spared 233 trees. We built 28 toilets, and we helped uh, almost 1,400 people uh, by uh, uh, sufficient uh, hygienic needs. Uh, and the most important thing is the toilets. Thank you so much. Uh, Mariah, can you maybe explain a little bit about what impact you w really want to make? We basically want to revolutionize the femcare industry. The femcare industry is dominated by four enormous companies worldwide um, whom are not transparent about what goes into their products. Um, um, and we want this to change. And therefore, we're leading by example um, and hope that others will follow. Okay, thank you. Uh, Axel, you are actually trying to make impact with, on a lot of different things. How are you trying to do this in Germany? In, in Germany, pretty much what it's coming down to is, um, I mean, first of uh, taking a look at the overall strategic goals of the mother company in the US. Um, and our first and foremost target that we have, it's a very small target, uh, is fighting climate change. Um, and we are doing this, uh, this is like the, the latest approach by uh, turning our supply chain into a regenerative agriculture 
um, format because we are convinced that with the right way to do agriculture, you can sequester carbon from the atmosphere and reverse climate change. Um, and we are adapting and translating this onto the Germans here as well by doing uh, test projects and working closely with, uh, with press in order to create awareness. What is a test project? Um, there's, for example, a field that's going to be there's going to be a potato field uh, where we are demonstrating that with the right way to plant uh, plant things, uh, you can first off fight climate change plus help the farmer um, on on both sides. So it's super beneficial. Uh, it's been a knowledge that's been around for for decades, but it got lost due to the industrialization of agriculture. So then you have a field where you grow these potatoes, but how do you make sure that people get to know about this? That they come there, or that maybe you get media interested? How do you get to tell the story? Because you also, yeah, you yeah. also have a not... Oh, you also have a non-marketing policy in, in the Germany, and that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a new market, True. right? And, and True. in the US, you have a cult status. Mm -hmm. You can work off that. How do, how do you... I mean, to tell, you, to tell you the brutal truth, this is the biggest, the biggest challenge that we are facing with. Because um, obviously, in order, we're still a business. So this is the first thing we need to remember. It's all about selling soap. And by selling soap, we are perfectly comparable to each and every other business. Only the, what we do with the money that we are getting in return is completely different from any other business. But first off, we need to sell soap. How do you sell soap? Usually you market your product, especially yeah. when you position yourself in distribution channels in mass market, for example. With no marketing, that's, that's definitely a tricky one. The thing is, what we've come to realize is that more and more people are sick of marketing entirely, especially consumers. So they are sick of being told that they have the fastest and best product in the world. It's, it's probably something that resonates with you a lot. Um, and you can perfectly deliver on their desire to be authentic by just telling the story. So it's word of mouth, talking to influencers and the right people and doing things together. So it's all about building a network. Don't get me wrong, it takes a lot of time. But it's the most sustainable way because you're basically creating a family, a family and a network. You are creating a family. Yeah, yeah, nice yeah it's, it's family. Uh, Mella, you really take a really light-hearted uh, approach. So for example, on the toilet rolls you see over here as well, sometimes it says, smile, you're losing weight, or it says, shit happens. Um, why are you taking on this way of marketing? Um, it's because we have a really boring product. It's about toilet paper. And toilet paper itself um, hasn't changed in the last 100 years. It's a patent that is actually uh, 100 years old. Uh, nobody changed it, nobody tried. The only discussion is which way you hang the roll. Um, um, but now um, we wanted to make um, a difference and we have a really, the most important thing is that with our product we want to build toilets. That's our main focus. Uh, but we want to be it, uh, not want to be it like it's really heavy or we're all about building the, 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 the toilets, we want to make it a fun way. So we created a lot of different designs. As you can see we have the, uh, the deluxe edition, the happy gold. People think it's, uh, now it's on sale actually. This is a picture of uh, the old line. But actually a lot of people bought it because they thought it was a more luxurious uh, line. It's actually completely the same paper, but it's just a little bit more expensive. Um, <laughs> and, and still people bought it, so it's, it's amazing. So that's really funny. The other line is our cheerful choice, and we work with uh, young designers, and every three months uh, our designs uh, varies. Um, and it's, um, yeah, these are designs uh, at the moment, and uh, actually in February our new designs are coming out, uh, together with some Rietveld students from the Netherlands, which is really cool. Um, and it's an online brand, so we do actually all of our things um, online. And, and how did you came about this idea to work with these designers? For example, with these students? Um, yeah, because the, thing, the biggest thing is we, we're not necessarily a toilet paper company. Uh, we're actually a branding company that sells toilet paper. Um, and our main focus is to create a story because that's the most important thing. And it's not about one post or do a social timeline. or um, It's actually about making a goal. So for us, we're 12 months ahead. 
We already know what we're doing in February, March, uh, October. Uh, why? Because in the whole month of January, we're building to our event in February. All of the month of February, we're building to our event in March. And this sounds really difficult, but as long as your story is really, really, really good, and you know that every aspect of your story is correct, and it's fun for people to, to uh, use and also to listen to, um, and then we make it also fun to see it online because a lot of brands just put a lot of information out there and you don't see it anymore. Uh, but with us, we actually have a lot of social interaction on our uh, sites um, uh, because people love what we're doing and what we're saying. And we say that at the end, we build toilets, but in a fun way. And, and it looks really cool in your toilet. Uh, and last year, you even sat on a toilet for 24 hours. It was in the Adam Tower. Yeah. How did you come up with this idea and how did it resonate with the people? Um, the guy on the left is my uh, business partner, Sander. The main reason was to piss him off. Um, <laughs> because uh, he doesn't really like to do those kind of things. Now, actually, we were sitting in the toilet. I was sitting in the toilet at home, and like the most of you, um, last there was um, a research, what we do in the toilet. Uh, Netflix came out as one of the biggest things, so a lot of people continue watching their series uh, on the toilet. And it's actually an example of how good our toilets are and how um, we have something that one third of the world doesn't have. Um, so for us, that was a way to show to the world, especially in the Netherlands, that we have it really well and we can sit on it for 24 hours easily. Uh, we did it. It was actually really fun because we had a really, really, really big uh, spectacle out of it with DJs and drinks and we invited a lot of press. Uh, we were interviewed by a lot of media companies. Uh, it was for your crowdfunding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the crowdfunding, um, it was, the main reason was the crowdfunding, um, but the crowdfunding was one of the parts of why we did it. Again, it was about creating a story and those are all multiple events that ended up in the 24-hour toilet sit-down. And did people like it? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, was we did it, we were, uh, it was online, so people could watch us 24 hours. So this was really cool, so we got a lot of comments and backups, so that was really cool. Um, and we had a lot of coverage, which was really nice. Uh, we had some, uh, we were live in TV shows and uh, radio shows as well, which was really cool. Um, and at the end, we raised a lot of money, and we actually used a lot of it uh, straight away to donate uh, to our partner for building toilets. So that was, uh, yeah, really cool. Also, who's doing a really different take on campaigns is actually uh, Mariah with Joni. So you actually started the company with this really big campaign, Chemicals Are Not For Pussy. Who came up with this idea? Because it's so bold. Who did this? Um, <clears throat> well, we were trying to figure out what to put on our first business cards. And um, we said uh, something like, uh, we aim to keep chemicals away from vaginas globally. And so people would say, what are you doing? And then we'd like hand them a card. And then you definitely would have a conversation or the person would run away, <laughs> um, one of the two. And someone made a picture of our business cards uh, and sent it in one of our friends' app groups. And a professor uh, who has nothing to do with like communications or marketing uh, like texted back, uh, chemicals are not for pussies and there's not been a creative that has come up with a better <laughs> slogan. Thought, I always thought it was a big, big company who was behind No, those. no, 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 no. I, no. Like, oh, I was really like, why didn't I think of this? No, no, well... <laughs> uh, Crowdsourcing your marketing campaigns. I really just believe, I mean, I believe, I don't know what marketing is. Uh, I, I, for me, it's all about communication and it's about having a story that I want to share that I believe that now that I know this, everyone should hear this story. And it's about that. And from that, if you're aligned with that, um, things like this will follow. <laughs> and then we received the billboard from this uh, uh, creative agency that wanted to donate it because they thought it was so cool. And we took one picture of it because we didn't really realize it was kind of maybe an important moment. <laughs> We've gained so much press coverage and the picture, the one picture was used so many times. Uh, it was really fun. And also other campaigns, I know one of your campaigns, you are uh, portraying like this really strong woman, uh, but you don't even, I don't even see like a picture of a product on that poster. Why are you choosing? Because most people, when they are marketing, you see their product. Because for me, it's not, I mean, it is about the product, but it's about the story. And um, what we came to realize, I mean, 
I mean, we could have maybe realized before, but menstruation is like a super taboo subject. Um, and I think uh, the way that we started communicating with Chemicals Are Out for Pussies was totally different than what we had been hearing beforehand. We all know, I think, the advertisements with women with white leggings uh, bouncing around and uh, like the blue uh, fluid going over the products or whatever. And we just approached it from a totally different aspect. Um, and from there, then we kind of started to resonate with like people are like, oh, feminist. And I am a feminist. And a lot of people are like, ooh, the word feminist, so scary. But feminism really just means equality. Um, and so for us on International Women's Day, I think it's a perfect opportunity to give women um, who are change makers in their own sphere, so like singers or creatives or whatever, who are doing something that resonates with me, uh, with us now as a company, um, to give them a platform. And I mean, nobody's really interested. I don't need to tell anyone how to use, well, I almost don't have to tell anyone. <laughs> Once in a while, like some Chinese guy will come by a stand at a like <laughs> at a fair and ask me how you use a tampon. Um, <laughs> but in general, I don't need uh, to tell anyone how you use a tampon or a pad. So that's not interesting. Um, and so when we, what I believe now that we have a company, we have this um, amazing opportunity, but it's also a responsibility to use our platform to educate, to inspire, to do something creative um, and to get people thinking and hearing important stories. You, you, you basically, uh, well, the, I mean, the, the, the whole box, the chemicals are not for pussy, is, it's a really bold statement. I mean, I mean there, a lot of big companies couldn't say the same thing, A, because it is an, uh, it's a lie, and B, it's your unique selling point. Um, and also on the packaging, it says uh, one conscious choice could change a whole industry, how is that? Are, are, are companies switching or are you still a lone wolf in this, in this industry? No, well, I mean, I see a lot more. If what you're doing is like a good idea, other people will try to do it. So um, we do see a lot of startups now who um, are like me and Wendelin in the beginning, uh, starting their organic cotton business. Um, so that's great. But what I think is most interesting is to look at these four big players and yeah. what they're doing. And so a while ago, I saw this a slightly inspiring uh, um, advertisement slightly. online, yeah, slightly, by one of these main competitors. And it was this video where I saw basically our whole Instagram, that's what it felt like, our whole Instagram talking, at like kind of talking vaginas. Um, um, and uh, you have to see it. And so I was like, wow, we, we could have kind of made this. But then at the end, the product that they were promoting were um, like hygienic wipes. Now that's sad, and that's not what I'm trying to promote. And so that was taking away, like the whole thing was like, you know, viva la vulva, uh, but then it was like a hygienic wipe. Ah, you missed the point. Uh, so there, I mean, and I don't think that, that's not going to resonate with people at the end of the day. I think it's good that we're being more open and we're trying to break taboos, but it, they're missing the point. And then I also see, um, uh, I mean, there are some, lighter points. I see uh, other brands also trying to be slightly more transparent about their uh, products. But at the end of the day, the product is made of plastic and it's not on the packaging. Um, and come on, let's change that. So I hope we will see more change. Looking Thanks. forward to it. Eric, I know that you really like also that they're making such a bold statement. You're always talking about that it's much more easy if you're the underdog. Can you maybe explain that a bit? Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it is more, mostly to do with this, um, well, yeah, it, storytelling is, like, if, if you're a fan of Disney, for example, there's always a villain, you know, and, and of course, in our real lives, you know, the, these villains, uh, they don't knock at our door and say, well, you know, hello, I'm Cruella de Vil, do you have any dogs, you know? And, but that doesn't mean that these villains aren't there. And I think that with, with uh, chemicals are not for pussies, without directly saying, well, this and this company is doing it wrong, you're really saying, well, this is, this is uh, different, and we are different, and you're pointing out that something is wrong. And the same is with our series. When you say something like fix, um, um, fix, then it means that something is wrong. And with with what you're asking is that 
why is, yeah, I think that people, that the underdog story, that we go to the cinemas because of that, you know, we always watch people who are underdogs and we root for them to grow bigger. And that's also why we started the company in essence, also to help underdogs. And it's for us really easy because it's a really easy story to tell. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to help companies that have a story already to polish that story than to fabricate a story which is a complete lie to sell a product we don't actually need. Are there any questions to any of the brands here in the audience? Or, yeah. uh, Eric, can you maybe uh, run? <laughs> no, I can walk. <laughs> can you please stand up? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I always have the impression that social entrepreneurship and marketing is not a really good combination, but apparently it is. I think there are a lot of good stuff you can do. What kind of marketing would you say are a bit taboo if you're talking about social entrepreneurship? What kind of things are like off limits? Oh, interesting. What do you guys think? What is off limits? What's off limits? Yeah. About if you want to use with marketing. Well, one, I don't know what marketing is, so I can't answer that question. I think... What it, would you never do? I would never do something that I don't believe in. If your uh, message is something that you believe in and you have the money, like, I don't know where you got the money. What if you got the money to get, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever, then do that. Um, it's about the messaging. It's about being aligned. It's about being clear. It's be about being authentic. It's about, for me, it's about stop compartmentalizing our social, spiritual, and professional lives. Integrate the social and spiritual life into your professional life where we're at our most power and then go for it. Nothing's off limits. Yes, please. Just, just to really share the brutal truth. It, it can be very tempting, especially when you, when you try to build up a brand with no marketing budget or whatever budget there is. Um, so the, the thin line or, or basically the, the barrier that, that is coming up and, and basically a question that you always have to ask yourself is every measure that you take, every step that you take needs to be 100% authentic and resonating with your own perception of yourself and your business. But what is authentic? If, uh, because it's such a buzzword. What do you mean? Yeah, basically when you, when you ever cross this line that you're doing something only in order to sell a product without the background and the intrinsic motivation why you are running this business, then you're done. Because this is pretty much the only thing that you have, and this is why, why people are buying your product. Uh, uh, for, for me, it's just very simple, and for me, it's lying. I mean, I mean the, the, you run the risk of a social enterprise saying, well, for example, we donate 25% of whatever to this cause, or we do this, and, and not doing that, that is off limits. You started the company because you wanted to do something, and you do what you say, and that's it. And so that, that for me, is off limits. Um, Even when the campaigns that we do, we... Mellet, do you ever see that? Because you, of course, are uh, donating a certain percentage of your revenue. Yeah. Uh, do uh, people ever check that, if you're really using this? Uh, yeah, a lot, actually. <laughs> um, and we, did you expect this? Yeah, we did. We, we, grew, uh, we grew quite big in the last year. Um, and uh, in the Dutch, we say, hoge bomen vangen veel wind. So we got a lot of attention, and people actually start researching our uh, company, which was a good thing. Um, and what all three of you said, it's really important that your story is true, and it sticks. So we, d we do not only donate 50%, but we capped our total company costs at uh, 15 to 17%. So um, it's all uh, set and, and done, and we have a uh, uh, Raad voor Commissarissen, we have a board of uh, uh, people that um, uh, check us. Uh, in Dutch we call them de Raad van Closet. Um, and they advise us and we have meetings with them. And they actually control our books. And one of our partners is the Rabobank. Uh, and they check if the story that we do is really true. Uh, and they check our numbers every year. And our partner in building the toilets is Simavi. And Simavi is one of the Netherlands' oldest foundations uh, in creating uh, hygienic uh, purposes in third world countries and they check us as well of course because uh, they can actually see how much, how much profit we are making so they start knocking on the door where's our half where's our half so uh, it's, a, it's a good thing 
and uh, it really works. But also what's really important, we were talking about, you need a lot of money for marketing. It's totally not true. Um, because the thing is, especially we're living in the greatest time of all uh, for marketeers. Uh, why? Because we're all online. And it's really, really easy uh, to reach uh, your target group. Uh, but the most important thing is what a lot of startups don't know who your target group is. So first of all, make your story stick. Make sure your story is true and you believe in your story. And from there on, create your target group. So make sure that who are you selling your product to. Uh, and from there on, you can start targeting them. Really, really, really easy. Our budget is only 250 euros a month. And we have almost 500 to 600,000 uh, reach. Uh, per month, and we have a rate show that's uh, almost uh, one in every four clicks buys on our website, and but it's all traceable, all reachable. So it's really good from this this time. But all three of you, and I know C Shepherd is going to come on stage too, uh, and and also a fans here. The fan base of all of these four companies and organizations, they're tight, no? With <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, have a, you have a fan base that you can really activate, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but how do, how do you have, what, what do you do? How do you activate them? Or uh, it, I mean, you could use them as a tool to to send your message. Uh, Dr. Bronner does that as well. Uh, how do you, how, uh, if you uh, if you want to get a message out, do you have like conversations with them directly? How do how do you how do you keep that engagement going? Well, I mean, I think a lot of stuff goes on via social nowadays. Yeah. Um, and so there are a number of ladies here uh, that are on social all the time for us, um, um, engaging with people. Um, and it's I mean I think it's basically. Again, <laughs> it runs on being authentic with your story, and then and then people will share it. Like it kind of, yeah. But do you use them as ambassadors, for example? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like, yeah. Like, I think people. I mean, that's what happens, and that's what I always say. Like, uh, you w want people to be just as excited about this topic as I am, and then you will necessarily you'll share the story. So there's. There's not a, like a secret um, formula or something. It's yeah. just something that happens by itself, I think, if, um, if what you're sharing is, resonates. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have to end this conversation now. Uh, please, uh, really warm applause for the panelists here. And now, before we ask the next person on stage, we're going to watch a small video of Sea Shepherd. Well, it's been 10 years now they've been trying to negotiate getting rid of the drift net. And uh, all the negotiations in the world uh, haven't stopped them so far in the North Pacific. So uh, uh, Captain Watson had decided that uh, uh, negotiation time was over and it was time to go in there and make a very specific statement over. For 450 million years, sharks have molded evolution in the ocean. Uh, every fish in the sea, its camouflage, its speed, its, uh, you know, its behavior has been molded by sharks. It's a very significant uh, apex predator, and uh, removing sharks from that ecosystem could have uh, huge um, detrimental consequences for the oceanic ecosystem. The biggest problem for sharks is the ever-increasing catch of sharks, mostly for the uh, for a part of their body that is considered uh, a delicacy, unfortunately, and that's their fins. To this day, sharks are being killed in massive numbers to cut their fins off and then throw them back into the water.
For 450 million years, sharks have molded evolution in the ocean. Uh, every fish in the sea, its camouflage, its speed, its, uh, you know, its behavior has been molded by sharks. It's a very significant uh, apex predator, and uh, removing sharks from that ecosystem could have uh, huge um, detrimental consequences for the oceanic ecosystem. The biggest problem for sharks is the ever-increasing catch of sharks, mostly for the uh, for a part of their body that is considered uh, a delicacy, unfortunately, and that's their fins. To this day, sharks are being killed in massive numbers to cut their fins off and then throw them back into the water. One of Sea Shepherd's approaches in protecting sharks is by targeting the poachers that are targeting sharks specifically for their fins. The recent Operation Driftnet uh, was able to stop a six uh, ship fleet from China that was using drift nets, which have been illegal since 1992, and uh, they were focusing uh, on sharks. So by shutting them down, we were able to, uh, of course, uh, protect a great many sharks that would otherwise have died in those nets. Sharks are apex predators. They are responsible for regulating the health of the marine ecosystem, and yet they are targeted with reckless abandon. If you look at the population of sharks in the Atlantic alone, populations of sharks have fallen by as much as 90% in just the past 30 years. And that's a big, big sign for what's happening across the board. I think it's important that not only uh, do governments need to step up their measures to protect sharks, I think we need to get rid of the uh, regulations that allow sharks to still be landed with, with their fins attached. I think what we need is a global uh, moratorium on the killing of sharks. Sharks should be full-on protected. Alex, the CEO and captain of Sea Shepherd is here and he will give a presentation. Please uh, welcome him on stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad everybody hasn't left yet, so I get to speak to the full audience. That's always a pleasure, uh, especially in my hometown, Amsterdam. So it's nice to be here tonight. Um, sea Shepherd is best known for our campaigns against the illegal Japanese whalers. Some of you might have seen those campaigns uh, called Whale Wars. And of course we are being labeled as terrorists, but mostly by our opponents, in this case the Japanese whalers. However, these campaigns have given us international recognition and people know about us all over the world now because of the whale wars that we've been fighting. We started those whale wars in 2002 and it highlighted with the, uh, with the case that was brought before the International Court of Justice in The Hague by Australia. Due to the pressure of Sea Shepherd, we were able to for force governments of the world to put pressure uh, from their people and to get Japan called before the International Court of Justice. That case was won by Australia, thanks to our uh, increased attention for this program, for this catch. And when Japan lost before the International Court of Justice, they in fact stopped whaling, so we claimed victory, only unfortunately a year later they started again with their whale catch, be it at a much lower number. And I don't know if you, some of you have heard it, over Christmas Japan announced to uh, leave the IWC and to start commercial whaling again. And of course the whole world was talking about it, how bad it is, because now they're going to kill whales in far greater numbers. But what they fail to realize, and what we've been saying, is that it's in fact very good news. Because at the same time, they have said that this year is the last year that they will kill whales in the Southern Ocean. So for us and for the whales, that was the best Christmas present ever, because it means that we won. After 18 years, there will be no more whaling in the Antarctic. So we claim this victory. And it's also the end of Japanese whaling, as we believe. Because yes, they are going to resume commercial whaling. But in fact, they've been doing this all along only they've called it scientific whaling. And they did this in the Antarctic. 
they also dated around Japan, and now they are stopping the killing of whale outside Japanese waters. So it is in fact a dying industry, and this is all about face loss. So Japan is preventing the face loss. They're preventing the world to claim, they're preventing Sea Shepherd to claim victory by saying we're going to leave the IWC, we're going to start commercial whaling again. But this, in fact, is the end of Japanese whaling. So we're very, very happy with that, and I really believe that, uh, yeah, that thanks to our campaigns, we were able to accomplish this success. It also gave us the opportunity to do something else. Now, you've seen a little bit in the video about our work in the Galapagos. Uh, I had the fortune to lead that program for six years. Uh, since five years, I'm back in the Netherlands in the cold, and uh, it's hard to get adapted here. I just got back from the Galapagos, actually, so I'm still a bit jet-lagged. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's very, very important that we keep up the work in areas like that. And the work we've been doing in the Galapagos, the, uh, the mission that we had, in the Galapagos uh, is in fact something that we really want to replicate around the world. So the working with the governments, the new strategy for Sea Shepherd, as some call it, is something that we in fact have been doing for 20 years. But most people only know us from the big TV shows, because the more media attention you get, the more people watch it. And of course, the more controversial you get, the more media attention you get. So because of our actions, where you saw some bottles being thrown, some ships being rammed, they had hit us a few times, uh, we hit them a few times, so there was a bit of interaction <laughs> between our ships. Uh, but because of these controversial campaigns, we got to grow as an organization, as a movement. And when we first set out, we had one ship that was able to, uh, to go about nine knots, which is about 12, 15 kilometers on a good day, downhill with a tailwind. Japanese whaling fleet would go much faster. Now, we have currently around the world 13 vessels, of which 10 are actively engaged in patrols and campaigns. So when we first started in 2002, we had one ship. We were able to do one campaign, maybe two a year. We're now doing about 25 campaigns all around the world. And that's all thanks to the power of the media. That's all thanks to the fact that we've been very controversial in what we did. But we did that for a purpose. We wanted the people to know what was going on. We wanted the world to know that Japanese whaling was, in fact, an illegal operation. And by stepping out of the IWC, they have now acknowledged that. And now they are, in fact, a rogue whaling nation like Norway and Finland, and uh, sorry, in Iceland. So now, for Sea Shepherd, if we go after the Japanese whalers, it'll be an illegal operation, because what they're doing now is against IWC regulations, is against what the world has deemed to be illegal. Whaling, commercial whaling, has been banned since 1986. So if anybody would resume commercial whaling, it would be in violation of what the public opinion around the world dictates. So by stepping out of the IWC, it gives us a much more opportunity to, uh, to go after the Japanese. Now, the campaigns we've been doing late re recently in Africa, you saw a little bit about it, uh, are campaigns where we're working with governments in Liberia, in Tanzania, and in Gabon, and Sato, and Principe. Those are four countries in Africa where there is no Coast Guard. They have no uh, law enforcement. But there's a lot of illegal fishing going on, a lot of poaching going on these, uh, in these waters. What we're doing is we're offering them an offshore patrol vessel and our crew, an experienced crew that has a long history in fighting uh, illegal fishing, in supplying law enforcement. And together with the authorities, we are able to shut down criminal operations. Now, in the past two and a half years we've been doing this campaign, we were able to, uh, and I have to count, 28 vessels have been arrested. You saw it on the slide back here. 28 vessels are now taken out of commission because of our campaigns in Africa. And we're really hoping that we can keep up and add more countries to this. We already have more countries interested, and we are probably looking at signing up three to four more countries this year. This is an enormous success, so we'll keep expanding our fleet. We'll keep using more and more resources to buy more and more ships. And I can tell you as a CEO, it's a bit of a head worry because I constantly have to find the money for it. It's not easy. Uh, but luckily, we're working together with organizations like Dr. Brunner, who is helping us uh, not only uh, with donations. One of the ships you saw on the slides is donated by Dr. Brunner. It's called the Emanuel Brunner, after the founder of the company. It also really helps that we get the soap from Dr. Brunner because our crew is uh, predominantly a uh, very strong activist uh, of nature and they feel that you can't put soap in the water because it destroys the oceans. So we're saying, okay, Dr. Bronner's soap, it's all organic, and you can put it in the ocean, biodegradable, nothing happens. So they no longer have an excuse to not <laughs> use soap. And I can tell you that the air quality on the ships has greatly improved since then. So thank you very much, Dr. Bronner, for that. So we're very, very happy to be able to work with these governments. Um, 
Sharks, very, very important. The reason I show this video clip is that the, uh, on one of the campaigns we did in uh, Liberia, we caught one ship, the Labico 2. Labico 2 was responsible for the uh, for killing of approximately 500,000 sharks every year. Now, if you consider that the global catch of sharks is between 74 and 100 million sharks a year, then 500,000 sharks is a big, big, big percentage of that. Labico 2 had an onboard uh, shark liver oil factory. That means that they were taking sharks, extracting the oil from their livers, and then selling that as food supplements around the world. It's a massive, destructive industry. And we are very happy to work together with the government in, in Liberia to shut down operations like this. Because only this way we can stop the, uh, the further decline of sharks around the world. They're down to maybe 10, 20% of the Eurasian population. So the battle that we fought was always against the whales, against the whalers. So the battle to save the whales has now turned into the battle to save the oceans. Because the oceans are in a very delicate situation that we really need to step up, not just to protect the whales, but to also protect the oceans. I really have to speak fast because I got 10 minutes and the clock is ticking there. So I'm going to unfortunately need to leave it at this. Uh, probably the shortest talk I've ever given. So thank you. We can still let him talk. So, if, does anyone have a question? Yeah, I see one question. Can you please stand up? The mic will hopefully come to you. I've got a question about. Um, you said that you did you strategically started uh, by like the first ship you had. Was it the str strategically? Um, how do you say? You said that you really fought bit when you started with the with the Sea Shepherd. Did you really think already ahead of what you were doing to be able to to reach your goal, or was it more an action? You mean with the, with the organization or with the anti whaling campaign? Yeah, the anti whaling. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, the idea for the anti whaling campaign was we knew that Japan had been killing whales for uh, scientific research, as they call it, and we've always said it was for commercial purposes. So. But unfortunately, nobody was taking any action. And we also knew that Japan was killing whales in an established whale sanctuary in the Southern Ocean. And nobody was taking any action because they were hiding behind the veil of scientific research. And people were saying, well, it's OK. It's been approved by the IWC. But it wasn't. And the IWC merely says that whales can be killed as, as, as a scientific bycatch or scientific whaling. But Japan was basically losing, using it as a loophole, so they were killing whales in massive numbers. So by going down there, by putting our finger on it, by getting the cameras to record it, uh, we got more and more attention for the topic until more and more people start speaking out against it, until eventually more pressure was laid on the governments in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, who it, and then 12 years later called Japan before the International Court of Justice. So yeah, there was a bit planned. Uh, but we never knew that it would take so long, nor that it would have the result that it now has. So yeah, some of it is chance and luck, and some of it is planned, of course. And you also said that the, the more shocking you do something, the more news you get. So how do you use storytelling in that sense? Now, I think that nowadays, with so much bad news around the world, unless you have a story that is shocking or controversial or just something that draws the attention, people don't pay attention. So you really need to shock the people. You need, really need to put it under their nose. And if you have images of gore, of blood, then people will pay attention. But you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to just bomb people with gory images because then they'll also turn out. So you have to find a ba fine balance between the beauty of it and also what's happening. So, but I guess that's, you know, that's the balance of life, to find the, the beauty and at the same time what is happening uh, to this beauty. Thank you. Yes, one other question. Uh, can you please? Thank you. I think the example of the children in Ecuador was really good, educating children uh, to protect the sharks. What's your experience in educating Chinese? You're yeah, referring to the shark finning. Yeah, to the shark finning. Well, I, I think everybody's always blaming the Chinese for the, uh, for the consumption of shark fin soup. Um, but all the countries around the world are responsible for killing the sharks. For instance, Spain is number three on the number of sharks that are being killed every year. A lot of people don't know that. So they are being supplied by all the countries around the world who are killing these sharks. So we're all responsible for it. We can't just say that the Chinese are you know, 
are the ones that are killing all the sharks. We all are. So it's our own, it's the responsibility of the world to stop it. And I think in China, there's a growing movement to stop the consumption of shark fin soup. For instance, government banquets is no longer allowed to use it. But it'll take time to, uh, yeah, to ch get, get this change further. And I just hope that we have enough time because if we continue this way, there won't be any more sharks by the next 20, 30 years. I see, I saw uh, you are raising your hand. Here you go. Uh, are there any actions in the movie industry to um, increase the um, image of the shark? Uh, yeah, in, in the unfortunately, there's always uh, movies like Sharknado, number one to 28, I believe. Uh, Jaws was the first uh, that put this, that put the shark as this horrible uh, predator that's going to eat you. Uh, luckily, there's been other documentaries like uh, Shark Water. Uh, Rob Stewart made that. Uh, unfortunately, he died in the making of Shark Water 2, uh, Shark Water Extinction. But that's coming out as well, uh, or it already is out. So there is, there is documents that are actually going against this, this horrible image of sharks. But I can only say, if you ever swum with sharks, you'll see that they're not the, the fierce predators that people turn, turn them into. They're, they're beautiful, magnificent creatures. And, and chances that they're going to eat you are pretty slim. So I think people just need to realize that sharks are just another animal on the planet. And, and they, shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be considered as monsters, as Hollywood would like us to believe. There's also a question over here. Can you please stand up? <laughs> this is about storytelling. Could you share some stories on your cooperation with Greenpeace, please? Uh, yeah, I can be pretty short on that one. <laughs> now, actually, one of our, the founder of Sea Shepherd, uh, Paul Watson, he was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. And uh, we have had situations where, where there was a possibility to work together, but it never came to fruition. So let's just say that we, uh, we differ in our methods. And at the moment, we're just two separate organizations that are uh, fighting uh, to save the planet. But no, there's no cooperation between us. I see one more question over there. Can you please um, give him the mic? Thank you. Hi, you, you said Sea Shepherd started fighting the whale uh, uh, catchers and then the, the shark fishers. And at the end, you said you were going to have a, like, a broader mission of saving the oceans. So what is the threats you are going to fight? Is it about plastic soup and climate change? Or what is the, who are you going to fight? Yeah, in fact, there's the, the three major threats to the ocean. You already mentioned those. That it's uh, plastic pollution, uh, global warming, and also overfishing. So we, as a marine conservation group that fights illegal fishing, we primarily focus on fighting of the third element, that is illegal fishing. But we, we recognize there's two even greater threats, maybe, and that's plastic pollution. Uh, so we do try to... Uh, to get more information about it. We're not specialists on, on fighting plastic. You know, that's not what we've been doing for the last 41 years. But we do recognize that's a serious threat. And in fact, uh, I believe by 2030, 48, the, the total balance of plastic in the ocean, the total weight of plastic in the ocean will outweigh the number of uh, fish and, and all other animals in the ocean. So unless we do something about plastic pollution, then we can fight as much as we want to stop illegal fishing, but it's not going to be enough. So more needs to be done, but yeah, we like to focus on the illegal fishing part. So two more questions, one of you and then one of uh, a woman over there. Um, how many sharks did you kill in 2018? How many sharks? How many sharks did you kill? Uh, kill. Not you, but <laughs> Sea Shepherd. No, safe. Safe? Safe, yeah, safe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The number of sharks that we save by shutting these uh, ships down, uh, of course, it's an estimate because we, by taking these ships out of commission, uh, we save the number of sharks that they could have been killing. But of course, that's an estimate. But I think over 2018, I can honestly say that we saved over a million sharks. Wow, over oh, one million. <laughs> and then the last question in the night is for you. Please raise. Uh, just one simple question. What makes you so passionate about these animals? Where does the interest come from? Yeah, I think, I think that's what you've been seeing today on stage. I mean, I think everybody here tonight has a passion. And I also have a passion. I'm an activist. I care about the ocean. I care about the planet. And I think that's what makes a successful business or successful organization by going after your passion. And that's something I always tell people, you know, if you truly believe in something, you need to go after your passion. Don't expect others to, to solve the problem for you. You know, believe in what you do and what you believe in, and then you can make the world a better, things, a better place. So for me personally, it's, it's that passion for the ocean that, 
that keeps me going and, and the beauty that I see every time I go out there. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking up this action and really helping uh, saving over a million only in 2018. So I hope you're going to save much more in 2019 and go on. Thank Please, you so much. a warm Thank applause. You. Then we're now coming to the end of tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Eric, please come on stage. What did you like about tonight? Well, I liked that, uh, you know, we have very, a, a, a mixed group of people here who are, have, uh, have different disciplines, different <laughs> products, but, you know, the same kind of, uh, you know, the message is sometimes more important than, uh, than the product. I mean, um, yeah, it's all, everything that we do, everything that we believe in is a story and how can we make stories that resonate and sometimes the word authentic has been thrown around um, and I think what I learned is maybe that authentic just, just means honest, truthful, that, you know, that intrinsically comes from inside and I think if we listen more to ourselves that we could get our message right by just listening. And if there are people here in the audience who do something with communication or they want to just brand their organization or their social enterprise, can you help them with one tip, what they can do tomorrow? Well, well if I think back to, to um, well, the, the examples that we've seen and also how we've worked on the documentary, I think it's mostly about simplifying. Just make it short. I mean, you can't say, uh, I mean, I, when I went to film school, they basically said to my, if there was a scene, like, that you can only have one emotion. So nobody can be angry uh, or, uh, and sad and, and happy and frustrated all in one scene. One scene can only be one, and that's the same with your message that you're maybe sending out uh, with your messages. You're, it has one central thing, and don't try to say too much. We all want to say a lot, but simplify. For examples, chemicals are not for pussy. Absolutely, that's a really good example. Thank you so much, and please, before you head down, go to the toilet and try some of the products. And uh, we have uh, Arjen from Nature's House, and he uh, is here, and on your way out, he will be there with a small goodie bag, so you can also use the products at home. Thank you so much for being here, and have a lovely evening.